In this video, I'm going to show you everything you need to use Logger Pro throughout the entire year. Logger Pro can seem complicated at first, but it's actually a really simple tool, and we'll only be using a few parts of it throughout the whole year, and they'll all be covered in this video. And so if you can understand what's covered in the video, you'll be good for the rest of the course. Logger Pro is designed to create graphs out of sets of data, which will then allow us to create maximum and minimum lines of best fit that are very precise. We want those for our lab reports, so that's what we're going to be using logger pro for basically we'll make a graph put error bars on the graph and then make a max and min line of best fit so the first thing i want to know is how to actually make a graph on logger pro when you make a new graph it automatically comes with an x-axis and a y-axis and a column right here on the top left for the x and the y numbers i'm going to fill those in in just a second but before i do i'm going to show you how to change the names of those axes because we're not really going to be using x and y as our axes titles for each graph we're going to be using things Things like height, position, speed, um, temperature, things like that, actual things that we're measuring about the world. So we're going to want to change the title of those axes before we actually do anything with them. So to change the title, you can just double click on this square. And that brings up this menu. If you go to column definition right here, this will give you all the important steps to actually naming and titling the column. Just as a heads up, these buttons probably look a little bit different on my computer than they do on yours, just because I'm using a Mac. But they're all in the exact same position in your version of Logger Pro. They just have slightly different symbols than on mine. So let's say that I'm making a position time graph. In a position time graph, time goes on the x-axis, so that's what I'm going to title this. And the short name for this is just the symbol that takes this spot if this name is too long to fit in a position. So the short name for time I can just say is t, and the units of time are seconds or lowercase s. So that's what I would enter in for this column. I'm not really worried about anything else. Don't really want it to be any other data type. Just keep it as numbers. Click done. So now my x-axis has changed to time. Now my y-axis, going to make that position, short name, p units m for meters. And I also want that to be numeric, not a date or anything like that. Okay, so I now have my axes ready and I can start to enter numbers into my table. I'm going to imagine that I did an experiment and tested time equals 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 seconds. And I'm just going to make up some numbers for the position. Let's say that the position is just increasing similarly, so I'll just do 4, 8, 12, 16, 20. You can see that as soon as I type these numbers, dots appear on my graph. So this is a graph of the data that I just entered in there, if this is the y-axis and this is the x-axis. Now there are two ways to scale this graph so that the data takes up more space so you can see more of it. You can either drag your mouse down here until it makes this double arrow symbol and drag back and forth. That physically moves where the graph is. If you go to the far right, it turns into the single arrow symbol, that stretches and compresses the graph. That's one way to fit the data to your graph, but there's actually a much simpler way. If you go up here and click this A button in the graph, that auto scales it. So it automatically stretches out the data to take up as much room as possible. So you're always going to want to do this when working with a graph. So that's how you put data on the graph. Um, if you want to change which axis is graphing what, you can go and click on the name of the axis and it gives you the option of using a different data table. So if I want to use position for the x-axis, I can just go here, click position, and now position is also on my x-axis as well. So I'm going to go back to time for now. So that's how you change what each axis is graphing. Let's imagine that we have error bars for these sets of data. We want to put on um, a certain amount of error that both the x-axis has and the y-axis has, just because that's going to be pretty common in the experiments. So to make error bars, I'm going to need a separate table to tell the program what values the error will take. What values of the error bar am I taking from my data table? So I'm going to go to data and click new manual column. This is going to add in a new column right here. And the reason why I'm choosing manual and not calculated is that this just means I'm going to enter in the numbers by hand. This is for when you want the computer to calculate the numbers for you, which I'll show you how to use in just a minute. So let's say that I want to calculate the time error, or I want to show the time error bars on this column. So I'll call this time error. And I'll call the short name TE for the error in time. And the units of error are the same as the units for the thing being measured itself. So that's going to be seconds, hit done. And so now I have this new column. And you'll notice this doesn't show up on the graph because I haven't told the graph that one of the axes is the time error. So let's imagine that my measurement uncertainty for time on my data table is 0.4. And that's going to stay the same for all the measurements. So I'm going to enter in manually 0.4. 
for each part of the column. So if this is my error and I want to represent it as error bars on the graph, what I'm going to do is go back to time, the thing that you want the error bars to be on, go to options, and then click error bar calculations, this checkbox right here. Um, you can either choose a constant, so I could just tell it that all of these points are going to have plus or minus 0.4, and that will actually put the error on my graph for me. If I go back here, I can also just say to use a column. So if I made a column of error like I did right here, I can just select which column I made, time error, and it will use each of these numbers for each of these points. So this is useful if you want some error bars to be bigger than others. If you have one number that has more error, like let's say that this has an error of two, it will automatically adjust that particular error bar, but not the others. So getting to use a column instead of just a fixed error allows you to change the individual errors on each point. But I'm gonna keep all of these at point. I'm gonna do the same thing with the Y axis. Um, I'll say new manual column right here. Say position error measured in meters. And I'll just make up some numbers for this. Let's say that we have an error of plus or minus two, or just plus or minus one, actually, two would be a little big. So I can go back to position because this is the thing that I want to put the error bars on. Double click, go to options, error bar calculations, use column. And so I just made my position error column with all the error values for that. So I can click on that. And now the error bars show up here as well. So this is really good. This is most of what I want to use Logger Pro for. There are just a few more tools that I need to show you. The last step of creating a graph in physics is always putting the maximum and minimum lines of best fit onto the graph so that you can understand the biggest and smallest possible line you can get out of this graph. To do that, you're going to click on this last picture of the lines right here where it says curve fit. You don't want any of the others. Just click curve fit. Now, this gets a little complicated, just pay close attention. You're gonna to go to manual, which basically means you're gonna to get to control the line itself, and make sure you have a linear line selected. You don't want a quadratic line or anything else. If you can't see this line show up in this picture, that might mean that the slope is either too small or too large. You can change the slope of this line right here, and it doesn't really matter what the slope is as long as you can physically see it on your graph so that you can start to manipulate it. For example, if the slope is 0 0.0001, the line immediately disappears. You can't see it, so you're not gonna be able to work with it and drag it along your graph when you hit okay. So you just wanna make sure it's something you can see. As long as you can do that, then the M and the B don't actually matter very much. So I'm gonna select one and one. And when I do that, this line appears on my graph. I wanna be able to drag it around and make a maximum and minimum line of best fit for my graph. To be able to physically move it around the graph, I'm gonna go up here, double click on this box, and go to the bottom right here where it says enable line drag. When I click on that, these diamonds appear on either side of the line. So now I can physically drag it along my graph. These two control the slope and this middle one right here controls the up down position of the line. So let's say that you want a maximum line of best fit. To make a maximum line of best fit, you want it in the bottom right corner of the square of uncertainty down here. So that's about right here. And in the top, you want it in the top left. That'll make it as steep as possible. Um, if I want to make this a little more clear, I can also drag this graph down a little bit so I can see where this is a little bit better. I would say that that's my maximum line of best fit. That is the steepest line that I can get that goes through all of these error regions. If I made it any steeper, it would no longer go through some of these boxes. Like if it were up here, it would no longer be going through this one. So it's not actually a possible line for my graph. You'll notice that this gives you the slope and the y-intercept of this line. So when your lab reports ask you for what is the slope and y-intercept of the maximum line of best fit, this box right here is where you're going to get that from. My slope is 5.275 and my y-intercept is negative 3.969. So that's where you get the numbers from for your maximum and minimum line of best fit equations. So this is my maximum line of best fit. So now I'm just going to add another line in the same way, go to manual and make my minimum line of best fit. So it's still linear. I can still see the line, so I don't need to adjust the slope at all. I hit OK. Go over here. Enable line drag. And now I can move this around like this. Okay, so I would say that this is my minimum line of best fit. 
So that's basically like 95% of what you need to know about Logger Pro right there. There's just a little bit more information you're going to need to know just to do something very specific with Logger Pro, which is linearization. If you don't know what linearization is yet, that's totally okay. I just need to show you basically one more small tool that you can use to figure out some more information. And that's going to be making a new calculated column right here. This is the very last thing that you need to know about Logger Pro. Let's say that we're doing something specific to our time measurements to change the shape of the graph. Let's say, for example, that we want to square our time values, but we don't want to do that by hand. We can just have the computer do that for us to avoid having to do calculations. So if instead of graphing position versus time, I want to graph position versus time squared, I can go to data, new calculated column. I'm going to name this new column time squared. And the short name will be t squared. And if we're squaring time, the units of that are going to be seconds squared. So to carry out a formula on a set of data, you just need to go to variables, select the column that you would like to perform the function on, and then write out what you want to do to that function. So in this case, I want to square time. So I hit done. And now I have a new column of all the time values squared. My original time values were 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so my new time squared values are 1, 4, 9, 16, and 25. If I want to graph this, I can just go down here and tell the machine to graph time squared instead of time. Obviously, this makes my graph look pretty weird, um, but this is what it would come out to if I graph time squared instead of time. Obviously, if I wanted to put a new error on these lines, I could just make a new column time squared error. I'll just make up numbers for right now. I can just go over here, error bar calculations, use column, time squared error. And so I could add error bars there as well. So if you want to make a new calculated column of numbers, you just go here, select new calculated column, and then just write out the equation that you want to perform on your variables. And that's it. That's literally everything that you're going to need to know about Logger Pro for this entire course. Um, so as long as you can just stick to those functions, you'll be good.